In this video, we'll, we'll discuss Stokes' theorem. Uh, we will be kind of uh, descriptive, and uh, for more details and proofs, uh, there are some very nice references uh, shown here, and uh, interested uh, students who should uh, go and uh, uh, read them. So, in order to explain the theorem, we have to make an introduction and say what are manifolds with uh, boundary and uh, then uh, show how to define volume elements and uh, an orientation on uh, the boundaries. So let's state the theorem. The theorem says, let's say that I have a manifold with a boundary as shown here. This represents the manifold uh, which is uh, uh, given by the surface here which represents its boundary and the manifold is the interior of the surface together with that surface here. So of course this is just pictorial. We will later explain what is a manifold with a boundary and what is its boundary. So let's consider n-1 form that is defined on M. Then uh, Stokes' theorem says that if we integrate this manifold only on the boundary, this will be equal to the integral of its exterior derivative over the whole manifold M. Uh, something that uh, needs also to be stated because it is important. Uh, omega and its uh, exterior derivative must be differential forms with compact support. We will explain what this is in a short while. So, we have to answer the questions. What is a manifold with a boundary? And then how the right-hand side here is defined. And for an integral to be defined, we have to have an orientation to be uh, given on, that, uh, on the boundary here and uh, a volume element. And in order to do the integration here, we have to explain how we restrict this n minus 1 form uh, only on the boundary. The orientation is quite important because you see that in order to have a plus sign relating those two integrals, the correct orientation has to be picked. Otherwise, the sign here uh, will be left uh, unevaluated. So these are examples of manifolds with boundary. The three-dimensional ball is a subset of uh, R3 consisting of points whose distance from the origin is less or equal to 1 and uh, its boundary is the two-dimensional sphere which, is, which consists of the points in R3 whose distance from the origin is exactly equal to 1. Here is a more descriptive example. Uh, we have a two-dimensional surface in R3 and uh, it has a boundary which is a closed curve here that is uh, the curve C and uh, <coughs> notice that S is uh, oriented by picking a normal vector at its point that goes let's call it from the inside of the surface to the outside of course uh, this is just a convention, what is inside and outside. So, if we pick this normal vector in a consistent way over the surface S, that defines an orientation on S, because uh, coordinates can be chosen here, whose coordinate vectors go from the first to the second coordinate in the direction of the arrow. If they go the other way, that defines the opposite orientation. Notice also that there is an induced orientation but by this choice. If you take these normal vectors <coughs> and bring them in the neighborhood of the closed curve, you see that the arrow here picks a definite direction of motion along the curve. And uh, this is the induced orientation on the boundary of the surface. Remember Stokes' theorem, as you know it from uh, vector calculus,
if you have a vector field in uh, R3, then the flux of its curve through the surface S is given by the circulation of the vector field along the curve. But in order for the sign here to be correct, one has to choose an orientation on S and compute the right hand side using the induced orientation on the curve C. Notice also here in, this, in those two examples that boundaries have no boundaries or the boundary of the boundary is trivial. So let's see how to extend those notions to more general differentiable manifolds and uh, let's start with uh, da some definitions. Let's consider Rn and uh, the subset of it called Hn which consists of the set of points whose uh, nth Cartesian coordinate is non-negative. So in this cartoon here the, the space Hn consists of the hyperplane that lies uh, that is defined by all other axes except Xn and all the points that uh, have similar coordinates, have the same coordinates with respect to x1 through xn minus 1 uh, and a positive or zero xn coordinate. Now the points that have a po strictly positive xn coordinate comprise the set xn plus and can be thought of as the interior of hn whereas the points that their coordinate xn is exactly equal to zero is the boundary of the set hn and you see that the boundary is the complement of hn plus with respect to hn hn is a topologi topological space with respect to the relative topology induced by rn let's see what this is Consider any topological space given by a set M and the set of sets tau that contains the open sets of the topological space. And then take any subset of M and make it a topological space using as open sets the intersection of any open set in M with the space S. This defines the relative or subspace topology on the set S and makes it, of course, a topological space. There are many topologies, of course, on uh, any topological space, but here S becomes a topological space with this particular topology. And this is the topology that we are going to consider in the case of Hn. So let's consider first Rn and take an open set of Rn which is uh, an open uh, ball or a union of as many as you wish of those. So if you take uh, the intersection of any such open set with Hn that gives an open set in Hn. So this is an example here. This U here is an open set in Rn and the shaded region here is the intersection of that open set with Hn. From that you notice that uh, uh, open sets in Hn with respect to the relative topology are not necessarily open sets in Rn. Like for example, this open set in Hn is not an open set in Rn. By making this clear, we can go ahead and define what smooth functions on Hn are. This is also quite simple to, to do by considering smooth functions on Rn and restrict them to Hn. And that will give 
the smooth functions on HN. Similarly, any diffeomorphism on Rn will give a diffeomorphism in HN when the domain and the codomain of uh, uh, that diffeomorphism has non-trivial intersections with HN. So we consider the restriction of the diffeomorphism in HN and we obtain a diffeomorphism in HN. Vectors can be defined by considering curves restricted to half points on HN and their tangents. And after having vectors, we can construct uh, the whole towers of tensors by defining one forms, tensors, differential forms, etc. And all the differential structure like exterior derivative, lead derivatives that we have considered for uh, any differentiable manifold. So let's now make the formal definition of a manifold with boundary. Let first M be uh, a Hausdorff topological space. Then a chart of M is uh, consisting of an open set in M and a map which is a homeomorphism from that set into HN. The differentiable structure is introduced by considering uh, coordinate transformations. So if we have two different charts, ui and uj, with coordinate maps chi i and chi j, then the map taking us from the image of the intersection of ui and, U and uj into hn into the image of ui intersection uj with respect to chi j is a differentiable functions differentiable function uh, from a region of hn to another region of hn a diffeomorphism a manifold of boundary has two separate classes of points the first one uh, are the manifold points a manifold point which can be thought as as being in the so called interior of the manifold are points that they have a neighborhood u such that under some uh, chart the image of u is in hn plus and contains uh, no points from the boundary of hn so this will make the space of manifold points which we denote by m plus The boundary points consist of the points that are the complement of M plus with respect to M. So any point that does not belong to M plus is a point that is that lies on the boundary of the of the, of the manifold with boundary. Notice also that if we have a chart on M, then when we restrict it to the region where U intersects its boundary that will give us an n minus 1 dimensional chart on the boundary and that makes the boundary of the manifold with boundary an n minus 1 dimensional manifold smooth functions are the ones that are uh, smooth in a way that it is uh, for regular manifolds if uh, uh, chi minus 1 composed with f is a smooth function from uh, hn to r. The support of a function is taken by considering the set of points on which f takes non-zero values. And if you take the smallest closed set, closed set that uh, contains uh, this set, this is called the support of f. So the support of f is always a closed set. A special set of functions are the ones that have compact support. That means that their support is a compact set. To say in simple words what this means is, uh, let's say if you consider Rn, functions with compact support are the ones whose points 
whose set of points that uh, f takes uh, non-zero values does not extend to infinity. So you can think of such points, such functions as, be, as being ones that do not ex extend to quote quote infinity. And uh, since functions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with n forms, uh, functions with compact support define what we call n forms with compact support. Then we go ahead and define what are vectors in, uh, the ma in a manifold with boundary. And as in the case of a manifold, these are uh, vectors that are tangent to curves in M. There are special curves whose all points lie on the boundary. And these define vectors that are tangent to the boundary. The rest of the construction of tensors is straightforward. Now let's discuss what is the induced orientation on, on the boundary. Let's start with a chart on M such that U has a non-trivial intersection with the boundary of M. So here is a cartoon of such a chart here. And such a chart necessarily has an image in HN that uh, also includes the points of the boundary of HN. We know that if we pick an N form on M, then if uh, uh, this is a volume form on an orientable manifold, that defines an orientation on M. Now, consider the vector minus dn. This vector is tangent to curves that uh, their image on the manifold under, chi, under the inverse of chi are curves that go along the x new axis in the negative direction. We call such vectors as being outward, outward on the boundary. And now let's define the n minus 1 form that is obtained by contracting omega with uh, this vector. We call this n minus 1 form omega prime. The action of any n minus 1 form is defined by its action on any n minus 1 vectors. So let's compute this action of omega prime on uh, any chosen set of vectors v1 through vn minus 1. This can be computed by the action of omega contracted with those vectors and minus dn. And omega is given by the wedge product of all the coordinate one forms, dx1 through dxn. And one way to write down the result is by computing the determinant of the matrix constructed by the images of all those vectors with respect to the coordinate one forms and uh, laid down in this two-dimensional uh, structure here that makes a matrix and then compute the determinant. Now notice the 1 over n factorial term here that is necessary uh, coming from expanding the determinant here. Notice now that the first column of this matrix is easily computed because it consists of the images of the coordinate vector dn under the coordinate basis dx1 through dxn. And of course, uh, when any dx acts on dn for n less than, for uh, uh, from 1 through n minus 1, that will give a 0. And when dxn acts on minus dn, that will give us a minus 1 here. In order to compute this determinant, see the structure of the matrix. It has a minus 1 here, and the sub-matrix here on the top 
right position which is an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix and the determinant now can be expanded along the first column and the result that we obtain is minus 1 to the n coming from this minus 1 here and the determinant of the n minus 1 times n minus 1 submatrix shown here but this contains the action of dx1 through dx n minus 1 on the n minus 1 vectors and going backwards we can express this as the action of the wedge product of dx1 through dx minus 1 on the vectors v1 through vn minus 1 uh, we have to be careful a bit with the normalizations here now this is a n minus 1 times n minus 1 matrix so there is a 1 over n minus 1 factorial needed to go from here to here so there is an n factor that uh, we end up in the denominator here now this formula is true for any vectors v1 through vn minus 1 so the n minus 1 form omega prime can be written in terms of the uh, wedge products of uh, uh, basis 1 forms uh, with this uh, simple equation now you see that omega prime is well defined on the boundary and the reason is that all vectors that lie on the boundary have no vn component in this coordinate system so this omega prime that we have just written is the chosen orientation on the boundary and this is called the induced orientation uh, on the boundary by the volume form volume n form omega so in Stokes theorem this is uh, the orientation that must be chosen on the boundary so that the Stokes theorem holds now let's discuss the restriction of n minus four n minus 1 forms on the boundary of m let's consider any n minus 1 form on m then we define the restriction of omega on the boundary to be uh, a linear function that acts only on vectors that are tangent to the boundary and you know that uh, such vectors are the ones that are defined to be tangent on curves that lie solely on the boundary now any n minus 1 form on the manifold m can be written in a coordinate system using this equation so this equation here has all the basis 1 forms but because it is an n minus 1 form one of them is missing so we have n such terms if you want to write if we want to write it this way each one has here a function which we put uh, an index mu to, for each term here and then uh, we use the notation of writing the wedge product in such a way that whenever there is a, a carré over a basis element it means we have the wedge product with this factor missing so here this wedge product here has n minus 1 uh, forms dx mu where dx mu is missing we also assume that the coordinate system is such that all the points that have x uh, n equal to x, uh, sorry x n equal to 0 that those will give the points on the boundary then let's consider a vector that is tangent to the uh, to the boundary this vector can be written as a linear combination of the basis elements d1 through dn minus 1 this is because 
the nth component is missing because we want it uh, this is tangent to a curve that uh, uh, does not lift itself above the, the, the boundary therefore when dxn acts on such a vector that will give zero because there is no uh, term proportional to dn so if you look at this sum here you see that all the terms where dxn is present when omega acts on vectors that are on the boundary of the manifold they will give zero because dxn will act on some of them and the result will be zero the only terms that will survive are the ones that dxn is absent which happens when nu is equal to n so from this sum only one non-trivial term is singled out which corresponds to nu equal to n furthermore the value of that function on the boundary must be taken when xn equal to zero because these are the points that lie on the boundary so the action of omega on the vectors v1 through vn minus 1 is given by omega n xn equal to 0 times dx1 through dxn minus 1 on the vectors v1 up to vn minus 1 so this is true for any vector any set of vectors and we can write the for omega restricted on the boundary to be given by this equation here that gives us an n minus 1 form on the boundary notice also that if we compute the exterior derivative of omega now omega defined on uh, uh, the whole manifold m we obtain terms where we have the derivative of this function omega mu with respect to dx nu and then we have a dx nu factor on the wedge fac on the wedge product but we notice two things first of all all the terms where nu is different than mu give zero because if nu is not the same as the absent term it will be the same as some other factor here and that will give a wedge product that is equal to zero so we have to take nu equal to mu and this sum here uh, singles out only one term if we, if we want to have a common factor for all terms we have to take dx nu and move it to the dx mu missing slot so this has to jump over m minus 1 one forms so we pay a penalty of uh, minus 1 to the mu minus 1 so the exterior derivative can be written uh, using this sum here has minus 1 to the mu minus 1 times d mu omega mu and then the n form dx1 times up to dxn so we already have expressions that we can use uh, for the Stokes theorem this goes to the integrand that uh, has the integral over the boundary and this goes to the integrand that goes to the uh, left hand side integration over the full man manifold with boundary m so we are ready now to state Stokes theorem and understand better what it means let omega be an n minus 1 form on the manifold with boundary m with compact support then 
if dm is its boundary, the integral of the exterior derivative of the n-1 form, which is an m form, is equal to the integral of omega over the boundary. For the right-hand side to be computed, we have to use the induced orientation on the boundary, the way we have described, and the omega that goes here in the integrand is omega restricted on the boundary. Let's see some implications of the Stokes theorem, which are simple but have uh, very deep uh, uh, consequences. First of all, if we have a manifold, that means there is no boundary, then uh, if you have n minus 1 form with a compact support, then the integral of its exterior derivative is always equal to zero. So that generalizes uh, what we know from uh, already for uh, integrals uh, taken over Rn. So if we, if you have a, if you integrate uh, the derivative of something, that gives you zero. Now, if omega is closed, that means the derivative of omega is zero. Therefore the integral of omega on the boundary is always equal to zero. If omega is exact, it means that uh, there is a form sigma, such as omega is the derivative of sigma. Uh, omega here is an n form, sigma is an n minus 1 form, and the integral of omega over m is equal to the integral of sigma over the boundary. In particular, if there is no boundary, then the integral of any uh, exact form with compact support is always equal to zero. Now, consider any n minus 2 form. Let's call it lambda. So, if the boundary of the manifold had the boundary, that means the boundary of dm, then the integral of lambda over that boundary will be equal to the derivative of uh, d lambda over the boundary of m. But using Stokes' theorem once more, then that should be equal to the derivative of the derivative of lambda, which we know that this is identically equal to zero because the operator d is nilpotent. So the derivative of any n minus 2 form over the boundary of the boundary is zero, which means that uh, a boundary does not have a boundary. Also, let's uh, focus now on uh, manifolds with boundary that have a metric on them. We know for such manifolds that there is a special tensor, the Levitsi-Vita tensor, epsilon, and let's choose it to be its volume form. We know that this is the natural volume that we expect coming from a metric. Now, any n-1 form can be considered to be the Hodge dual of a vector. If you take the Hodge dual of a vector, you will obtain an n minus 1 form. Then, one can show that the exterior derivative of omega, which is the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of V, is equal to the divergence of V with respect to the covariant derivative uh, derived from the metric. That we will explain later when we uh, discuss uh, manifolds with metrics and uh, parallel transport. So, but the final result is this, <coughs> and gives d omega to be proportional to the uh, volume form and the function here, which is the uh, divergence of v. And uh, more explicitly written, uh, 
this is the divergence of V times square root of G times the uh, n form dx0 times blah 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 dxn minus 1. So Stokes theorem written for omega can now be translated uh, for uh, the vector field V. So the derivative of omega integrated over m will give the same result as omega integrated over the boundary. Therefore, the integration of the function, which is the divergence of v e over the manifold, will be the same as the integral of the uh, n minus 1 form, which is Hodge dual to v. So, we physicists write this equation here in this form. So, the left hand side is square root of g times the divergence times dnx. Now the right hand side has extra structure that we have not described but it's easily understood. Uh, if we have a metric the boundary here has a, a normal defined on it and there is an induced metric on the boundary. So this integral over the uh, Hodge dual of v is actually the integral uh, with respect to the induced metric of the projection of V on the normal of the surface. And that should be more familiar from a vector calculus than uh, the form written here. So let's apply this to some uh, uh, simple examples. Let's consider as our manifold to be the northern hemisphere of a sphere. And uh, it has as a boundary the equator, which is a closed uh, one-dimensional curve. So a coordinate system is given in terms of uh, spherical coordinates in R3 from the, those equations here. Just uh, be careful that the range of theta goes from 0 to pi over 2 and r has uh, a fixed value equal to the uh, radius of the sphere to which uh, s is contained. Let's remember some facts uh, for spherical coordinates on R3. So Cartesian coordinates are related to spherical coordinates from th these relations here. And if we want to compute the coordinate transformation, we have to compute the matrix of derivatives of uh, x with respect to x prime. And simple calculations give us this matrix here. And the inverse transformation is given by those relations here. And uh, the matrix dx prime by dx is given by the inverse of that matrix. Now, if you want to relate basis vectors from one coordinate system to the other, we use the coordinate transformation rules. So for example, the R coordinate vector is given as a linear co combination of the X, Y, and Z coordinate vectors. Uh, the derivatives of the components come here, which give us this familiar relation here. Now, hat X, hat Y, and hat Z are the unit vectors in the X, Y, and Z uh, coordinates. And these are the same as the coordinate vectors dx, dy, and dz. Now, the coordinate vector dr happens to have uh, a unit length. And uh, you see that uh, uh, this unit vector in the r direction is the normal vector on the space S. The norms of uh, the d theta and d phi 
coordinate vectors are not 1, they're given by r and r sin theta, respectively. Therefore, the unit vectors in the theta and phi directions are given by those expressions here. So, let's write down Stokes' theorem as we know it from vector calculus. The right-hand side gives us the flux of the curl of a vector field E, and the left-hand side gives us the circulation of that field on the boundary. So, the integrand on the left-hand side is written easily as ex dx and dy dy and ec dz. Now, to compute the, in the integrand of the right-hand side, we start with a curl, write it down in Cartesian coordinates in a familiar way, and then we compute the inner product of the curl with uh, the uh, normal to the surface, n hat. So this gives us those terms here. And x and y and n z are the components of the unit vector. And then we have the surface element, ds. This is given by r squared times the solid angle, d omega. So that's r squared sin theta d theta d phi. So we obtain this expression here. It has a common factor, r squared sin theta d theta d phi. So we keep those two expressions to compare them with the computation that we will do with differential forms. So let's consider the one form, omega, which is ex dx plus ey dy plus ez dz, dx dy and dz now being the uh, coordinate one forms of the Cartesian coordinate system. Then d omega can be easily computed by uh, taking the exterior derivative of the of those two one forms, three, sorry, of those three one forms, uh, those will give uh, uh, these three linearly independent two forms obtained by the wedge product of the coordinate basis one forms, and uh, here we obtain, as you see, the components of the curl of E. So, now let's restrict the omega on the sphere so that we can do the integral. To do that, we compute uh, the components of those two forms in the d theta d phi coordinate basis, which is tangent to the uh, hemisphere. So if you do this computation, you obtain uh, the action of uh, the coordinate uh, basis one forms on the vectors d theta and phi. These are the correct signs. And then we apply the definition of the gradient for dy, dz, and uh, this will give us the y and z coordinates of the vectors, d theta and d phi. But we notice that this combination here is nothing but the x component of the cross product of d theta and d phi. Here I remind you the expression of the x component of the cross product of any two vectors a and b. So now that we have the image of uh, d theta and d phi under this form, we have all the independent components of these two forms here, restricted on the surface. Therefore, uh, dy times dz is the one form that is given in terms of d theta times d phi with uh, this function here, which is the x component of d theta cross d phi. We can do a similar computation for the other two forms, dz times dx, dx times dy, uh, 
and each time we obtain a different component of the cross product of the theta and the phi. But notice that the theta is r times the unit vector theta and the phi is r sin theta times the unit vector phi. So the cross product is given by this expression where now we have the cross product of the unit vector th theta and the unit vector phi which gives us nothing but the unit vector r. So this cross product is r square, th r square sin theta times the unit vector r. Now if we are on the sphere r is equal to the radius of the sphere and the unit vector r is the normal to the sphere. So the same thing is true for the hemisphere. Therefore, the cross product of d theta and d phi is r squared sin theta times the unit normal n to the hemisphere. Therefore, d omega restricted on the hemisphere can be written in this form here and you see that r squared sin theta d theta d phi is a common factor. So when we compute the integral we have basically to compute the integral d theta times d phi, a two form on a, the two dimensional manifold S, times the function here that is a common factor to d theta times d phi, which is this one. So the definition of this integral is an ordinary two-dimensional integral of this function, but this is nothing but the projection of the curl of E on the unit normal N. Now the integral of omega restricted to the boundary of the hemisphere, which is nothing but the curve C, is given by this expression and is easily seen to be equal to uh, the integral over the curve of E dot dl. So you see that the generalized Stokes theorem that we just described is nothing but the Stokes theorem that we know from vector calculus in uh, in this uh, example that we just uh, showed. Now let's look how we compute this integral here. I'm writing here again the uh, coordinate transformation from spherical to Cartesian. Now if we are sitting on the equator then r is equal to uh, the radius of the sphere and theta is equal to pi over 2. So x, y, and z take these restricted values, r cos phi, r sin phi, and 0. Therefore dx, dy, and dz restricted on the circle are just the derivatives of those expressions here, minus r sin phi, d phi, r cos phi, d phi, and 0. So when omega is restrict restricted on C, we have just those two terms, which are nothing but the uh, phi component of uh, the vector field E times R d phi, which is nothing but dl. So indeed, this is the dot product of E times dl. Now, Let's look how the Stokes theorem that we uh, defined in this uh, uh, session uh, gives us uh, another familiar way of looking at the Stokes theorem in uh, vector calculus. So now let's consider a vector field E and its divergence uh, d dot E. Now if this is integrated over a volume Let's take uh, the three-dimensional ball to be that volume. Then this is equal to the flux of E, 
uh, on the boundary of the volume, which is S2. So that is E dot N, N is the normal to S2 times dS. To see the connection with uh, Stokes' theorem, consider the two-form sigma. And this is constructed by Ex dy times dz and cyclic permutations of x, y, and z. So that's a two-form on the three-dimensional ball. Now, if we restrict uh, sigma on the sphere, then uh, uh, we can compute the restrictions of those two forms the same way we did before for the hemisphere. And we will obtain the same results, of course. The only difference being that uh, theta takes values between 0 and pi for the full sphere instead of the hemisphere. So the integral of sigma over the closed two-dimensional sphere is nothing but E dotted with the normal R sin theta d theta d phi. So that gives us the right hand side of this equation. And if you if we compute d sigma, you see that this is a two form. The exterior derivative will give us a three form. And in a three form we can fit only three different coordinate basis vectors, uh, one forms. So when we differentiate each two form here, only one term will survive, the one that differentiates with uh, the missing coordinate of the two form. So from dy dz, we will obtain a dx and the derivative of ex with respect to x. Here, we will have a derivative with respect to y, a dy here, derivative with respect to z, and dz. And, of course, we notice that uh, those three forms here are equal to dx, dy, dz, since we move in a positive way in the cyclic permutation of x, y, and z. Therefore, dx, dy, dz can be taken as a common factor, and uh, what remains here in the parenthesis is the divergence of the vector field. So, d sigma is the divergence of E, in the sense that we know from vector calculus, times dx dy dz, and its integral over the three-dimensional ball, sorry for the two here, is equal to uh, the integral of uh, the divergence of E.